Good afternoon. The, uh, the, well, I've been in that job for 30, 30 years, even more, so you will get some uh, historical perspective. And the problem we're having now, you will see, may, be, uh, may have been exactly the same 30 years ago. So this is this fine young chemist <laughs> with great hopes in the, <laughs> in the 1980s and 1990s. You can see that we were wearing some satellite transmission tools in the ears. So that, and don't look at my daughter. <laughs> you can see my daughter in my belly, actually. And that would be enough for me to be sanctioned now in 2019. They would take my baby of, out of my hands. So this was in the 1980s, where our life was so much simpler because we had the Russian metandrostenolone. Uh, that was Danabol. There was maybe a few anabolic steroids, so this was one of them. The Russian, uh, the Russian, the Soviet weightlifters were getting caught smuggling uh, metandrostenolone in Montreal Airport. They were going to help their colleagues from Canada. They did not understand why they were sent to prison. There were the problems of East Germany and their state-owned labs decoction. And we had Winstrol V. Winstrol V was veterinary Winstrol preparation. Uh, this is Tanozolol. And at the time, it was believed that Tanozolol was invisible. Well, it was in part, and we were struggling. Actually, on the screen, it is a spectra of uh, 3 prime hydroxy stanozolol. So it was believed to be un invisible, but it did not prevent Ben Johnson to get caught in Seoul with that, uh, with that invisible steroid that produced quite visible effects. In, the, in 1984, you can get this press clips where it says, uh, Don Catlin was heading the lab in UCLA, says that the lab's method could detect 0.5 micrograms of a substance in one ml of urine. So for those of you who are not chemists, it's like I, I wouldn't even not use the swimming pool analogy because it's a mountain of, this is like 500 nanograms per ml. But that was at the time believed to be very, uh, I don't know, it was even high for the time. Anyway, it was believed to be a major breakthrough. And nowadays, we're discussing results at 60 picograms per ml. Uh, so this is kind of different perspective. What we have nowadays in the background is the result of the investigations done in the Moscow uh, Moscow works, let's say, works with an S. And of this, I just want to draw your attention to what uh, some of the drugs that were detected uh, or reported to be present in uh, their system on their limbs. So what we have here, uh, we have, of course, testosterone, but oral turinabol, which is the hydrochlormethyl testosterone which had me, for those of you who watch Icarus and wonder why I'm like that, it's because I've realized that we've been, we've been, how can I say, <laughs> we've been fooled by uh, this lab and they were using steroids that we thought were not available. And so in, as soon as in 2000 and, uh, 2008, Oxandrolone, Ostarin, which is the other name for S22, EPO, and other steroids, including, um, including uh, designer steroids such as uh, desoximethyl testosterone. So the progress that we had, uh, that we have in the, uh, this recent period of time is because there was nothing. We have to think it's okay that we are, uh, we are looking at what we're doing now and we are asking the system to be better. But you have to keep in the back of your mind that there was nothing, nothing 
before, let's say, uh, realistically, 30 years ago. So it's a relatively new science. That said, the techniques that we use to detect doping are the same that are used in toxicology of forensic science. The difference is the amount. When somebody died from an overdose, the levels are huge. What you have in sport is people that may have doped, look how politically correct I am, may have doped, <laughs> and that are trying to evade uh, detection. So we're running after traces. So the increased sensitivity that we have nowadays are due to instrumentation, for sure. Going from GCNPD, immunoassay, to first the GCMSD that are benched up in the 80s, and then to GCMSMS and to LCMSMS. But we have also great progress, that is that we are now ready when a new substance, a designer substance, when something is coming on the internet, because this is the ball game now, the wild pharmacy distributing anything on the internet, the black market is everywhere. So we have now a timely identification of new substances and we have ways to detect them. So we can patiently wait and we don't have to wait this long. And another major breakthrough is the discovery of long-term metabolites that had expand dramatically our detection window. All of that is possible because there was money put in the lab and the financing. I cannot have this to work anyway. And you have <laughs> financing laboratories <laughs> and research. This is a major difference there was no money put into research before the, lab, the labs were doing this on their own. So if you want to have a recap of everything, I guess, that was done since the 70s, there are a few uh, very good paper. I cited one here from my colleague, uh, Costas, uh, that gives you kind of, kind of a timeline. But now let's look at uh, what we are facing now, looking at this huge sensitivity. This is one paper coming from uh, the Cologne lab, but in 1996, just prior to the games. Uh, they were, it was very close to the games uh, when, they, uh, when they published that they had increased sensitivity by using high resolution mass spectrometry. And in fact, by retesting samples, which is something that we've heard lately, they got 75 positive that they wouldn't have had normally with stanozolol and with metandienol. So that was increased sensitivity that permitted this, um, this I'd say, breakthrough. So, High resolution mass spectrometry was imposed in all the labs. It was also imposed during the games, and that was a fiasco. That was a fiasco not because of the technology as written here, and technical difficulties with the high resolution mass spectrometry that was more, um, how can I phrase this? A political <laughs> difficulty within the lab. So they didn't trust, they didn't want to report the results that they got by high resolution, and it was decided, we understand now what uh, had been formed, uh, but so it was decided probably uh, at the subcommission at the time that nothing that couldn't be confirmed with low resolution was going to be uh, trusted as being a positive, so there were none. And they pay attention to this, uh, the other part. This is, look at the time, we're more than 20 years ago. This more sensitivity, isn't it going to bring more problems, alternative explanation? And at the time, Capobianco uh, was exonerated because it was said that he tested positive for stanozolol by contaminating, by eating contaminated meat. So I'm standing here in front of you, and this is the same story here today. <laughs> this is where we stand, this is exactly the same thing. We were living through this sabotage, contamination in the 80s, 90s, we are still here today. So, 
where are we? Oh, this is in French. <laughs> where, this is where are we today? <laughs> so the ball game now. Uh, the IOC has retested the samples from Beijing and from Cologne. Uh, from Cologne. <laughs> You're in my <laughs> London. And they came out at this stage, early testing, they had 100 positive more cases. Uh, so this is the background. We also have the results. And for those who say that the testing is not efficient, I would say that getting out by retesting 100 positive out of 1,000 tests is kind of a good percentage. That shouldn't be. These are the results from the Toronto Pan Am Games in 2015. We had 32 adverse analytical findings. And of these, of course, we found the poor Mexicans with the clenbuterol. But some of these substances were real doping substances, and they are all, and I don't know the problem, the ball. it's the right column. You can see substances that were fairly new at the time. So this was what we, uh, what we had. And then we had the weightlifting championship at the end of 2015, where we had a rate of 14% positive. So that is one four person, more than one out of 10 sample ended up positive. And what we have were all these results were low level results. These are results that wouldn't have been caught if we had not had the long term metabolite for the hydrochlormethyl testosterone, 12 findings for this long term metabolite. And we had as well Ibutamorem, that was our first case, case in the lab, 12 picogram. LGD4033, the first case at 0.3. Ipamorelin, 0.1. Letrozole, all below 0.5. And the norandrosterone, it's a steroid that could be present normally in the urine. We had four, five or six cases all close to two nanograms per ml that were uh, analyzed by IRMS. Look at what we have here. Oh, thank you, sir. This is very kind of you, how does it work? Technology, it works. This is the technical document on minimum required performance limit that many people think should be what we should be doing. Well, look at this. This is for anabolic steroid, five nanograms per ml. So 5,000 picos. For the hydrochlormethyl testosterone, two nanograms per ml. For ipamorelin, two nanograms per ml. So it is way beyond, way above what we see in the urine samples. The new compounds that were added regularly are these compounds, ipamorelin, ipamorelin, LGD, all the SARMs. The SARMs are flooding the internet. They're all everywhere. LGD4033, the IF inhibitor, we got one case, never seen after that. RAD, SR9000, and the GRPs. And the list is increasing all the time. We have now, nowadays in our lab, we have two main procedures, an LCMS1, LCMSMS, and a GCMSMS1. For a normal male urine sample, we can deal, and hopefully negative, we can deal with the testing with less than 5 ml of urine. So basically what we do is the, let's say, solid phase extraction, first purification, enzymatic hydrolysis, liquid-liquid extraction, TMS derivatization, GCMSMS. Straightforward uh, coming from the 1980s. And then we have for the stimulant, the small peptide, the SARM, et cetera, we have a liquid, a liquid LCMS, LCMSMS procedure that is what we call a dilute and shoot. 200 microliters of urine, you add 400 microliters of your uh, injection uh, phase, and then you inject. So the instruments are so sensitive that we can now use techniques like that. Let's see where we go with this. So this is uh, for our colleagues <laughs> that are in the room. 
So this is the techniques that I've just, and the instrumentation that we use and the column, but we do something in our lab that may not be uh, that may not be done elsewhere or more frequently. We adjust the volumes in function of the gender and the specific gravity. If it's dilute, we take more. And these are the conditions for the dilute and shoot. We are now, I will discuss also what it is to go to more sensitive instrumentation with the LCMSNS. So this is the Sipa Morelin finding, the first one that we got. And really, for those of you who operate an instrument, this is an electrical spike. It is really, but it was right at the, um, at the illusion time of Ipamorelin. But this is so weak a signal, it's like kind of, let's see what we have and let's see what we'll do with this. So uh, it confirmed. It confirmed fully, this is the athlete sample at 100 pico, this is the blank, internal standard, this is the reference. So since 2015, we've had 11 cases, which is not a lot. The highest we've seen is 3,300, but don't dream, it's, <laughs> I don't know, it's one in a lifetime. But most of the cases are way below. So this is Ipamorelin, and uh, just remember, that for Ipamorelin, the MRPL is at 2,000. This is the difference with this blurb that I've shown you uh, at 300 intensity with the 4,000 Q going to the ABS 6500. We got look at the signal we have. So even a normal non-eagle eye uh, analyst was able to, would be able to pick this up. So this is the difference in sensitivity that we have uh, with the new instrumentation. So it's still improving. So for those of you who were stick in the past, who are stick in the past with the nanogram per ml, e, I think we can go uh, further and lower. And this is a signal as well to show you the difference. This is uh, S22, a starin at 60 pico. And this is what we have, again, for the dilute and shoot on the, uh, on this, uh, this more sensitive instrument. So a clear gain in sensitivity. Again, MRPL is 2,000 picograms per ml. LGD4033, uh, this is something that floods the internet. Everybody is buying kilos of this powder from China and they are, prepara they are making preparation, uh, preparations of this SARM. Look at the levels we have since 2015 and nowadays. It's very small, except one case of almost two nanogram per ml, which is the MRPL. All these cases would have been unreported. And whoops, just before, look at these. We have here some kind of evidence that was taken for, uh, for doping. Uh, several of these cases have multiple uh, doping agent, agents. Uh, now, if we go to the GCMSMS, uh, this is the, uh, the validation data. And some data, we have the limit of detection. We can see clenbuterol, 3 picograms per ml. All the molecules bearing a chlorine atom Clenbuterol, Clostable, DHCMT, will respond very well with, uh, with our techniques, under these techniques. Oxandrolone is less uh, efficient, we know. Uh, salbutamol, stanozolol is quite good. Trenbolone metabolite, it's not so bad. Unexpected outcome. The reason why I'm saying this is that we know when there can be a problem, that is due to us going down in sensitivity. And in the 2010, when the GCMSMS instruments started being included large level into, uh, not large level, but uh, in many labs, unexpected outcomes. So in the, the, I'm bragging about my clever work. So this is, <laughs> this is us reporting clenbuterol in the early uh, 1980s. 
during the Cologne workshop and the first case reported by Manfred Donnerke's Cologne lab at the time uh, uh, using um, uh, our description. They, built, they, they included clenbuterol testing. They reported the first case in 92. Everybody is happy. What was the outcome? We learned about meat production. And the, uh, so this is all the findings that we have for clenbuterol from the day it was banned to when we included the GCMSMS. So this is 2010. We had less than five cases per year. And the concentration, I've looked rapidly, it was the nanogram per ml, a lot of very high uh, levels. Then we introduced the GCMSMS 2010. Whoops, we have all these new cases, but we all went like, ah, oh, new technology, more science. And what were uh, the sports? Bodybuilding, weightlifting, cycling, and a few sports that we couldn't really say they couldn't use clenbuterol because it can help breathing, because it's to lose weight. So, that made sense, nothing that made you very nervous about anything. And since then, the cases have kept sometimes higher, sometimes, but it never went down. But surprise, surprise, this is due to the work of Cologne and other labs. Uh, they discovered that people coming boarding an airplane negative with board back to um, Germany uh, positive for clenbuterol when they were in Mexico or in China. And it's all well known nowadays. If you go to Mexico, you don't know, but you have great risk of ending out, uh, of heading out uh, for clenbuterol poisoning. I wouldn't say poisoning, it looks terrible, but being fed with clenbuterol out of uh, uh, a uh, deliberate act is for me some kind of poisoning. So it's a known fact. And I can say that uh, it's reflected in the testing. Nowadays, if a competition is held in Mexico, they, we know that we are going to have several cases. So initial testing procedure, as I say, the volume varying with gender, so we have what we have to do with the GCMS steroid procedures is that we have to detect very low levels and at the same time report an accurate steroid profile with concentrations that may be up to the micrograms that are up to the micrograms per ml. So we vary the volume, we make a solid phase extraction and therefore we have no choice in our lab, we cannot use automated sample preparation, which is really frustrating uh, but we, because it required having fixed volumes. And what are some of the drawbacks that we have? It's this carryover. We have to be careful about the carryover. So this is the standard that we use to check the performance of the machine and making sure that the retention times are okay. Look now at what we are using. We had to replace tanozolol with you. Is it five minutes? Have I he heard the, the music? Where is Michael? No? Is it okay? Six minutes. There we go. So tanozolol D3 it deuterated in order to not contaminate all the samples. So we can have an end and to not have carryover from other samples. Look at the number of washes that we are not do, now doing after the, the injection and before the next one. So we've tried greater sensitivity, why not? We were promised by the company manufacturers, look, try this, it's going to be wonderful. So we've tried this 7010 instruments that you've been uh, maybe you didn't pay attention, but Smirtle uh, just told us about this machine. So, and we were so enthusiastic after this try that we even reported this to the colleague. It's great, it's wonderful. We can improve detection. These are some of the positive that we confirmed on the other already sensitive instrument. Look at what we have on this new machine. It's wonderful. It's wonderful, but uh, not so much because if it was okay for exogenous steroids in the low picogram ra range, it was horrible for steroid quantification, for the steroid profile. 
So we were stuck now with, we are stuck now, if we want to use this instrument, we got to do two injections. One in the splitless mode for exogenous substance, one in the split mode for the profile. So, and we keep it for the confirmation of steroids in the low concentration, but it is a compromise that we had to do. Now, major breakthrough, major. The long-term metabolites of these 17 methyl steroids, this is what I think is equivalent to being able to detect EPO. The first one, it's oxandrolone, the long-term metabolite. Uh, I just show you the structure because it's always this type of um, chemical that you will see in the long terms. You have very nice mass spectra produced by a characteristic fragmentation. It responds very well. Everybody is happy. Uh, we got metandienone the long term. It is less funny with metandienone, more ion transition, so therefore the sensitivity might be a bit different. We have the reference standards, and lucky we have them because now we can confirm and everything. And look, it's really working. This is an actual athlete sample with only the long term. This is the pool. Nothing is there except the long term. And then we have the hydrochloromethyl testosterone. So this is the this steroid that caused all this uh, dramatic um, outcome, I'd say. And this is the um, this is from Tim Sombolevsky, the Russian lab. And they came out with uncovering this uh, designer, this uh, this steroid. Of course, they were having a lot of pools of samples to test for. And they came out, now we have the standard, it was uh, identified by synthesis. But all, not, all these long-term metabolites are not equal. This is the, the HCNT long-term bearing a chlorine atom. The LOD is five picogram per ml. Look at the signal we have. This is for metandienone, the same similar, but we cannot go lower than 50 picograms per ml. And if we look, therefore, at the findings internationally, when it was discovered, uh, they did Cologne and Moscow some retesting, so this is the blur, but normally it's less than 100 samples per year. That said, it's almost 600 athletes. Think about this. We catch one person, maybe, but this is 600 athletes. Same thing for metandienone, which is more, I would say, prevalent. The long term was discovered here, look at the bump, and it's kind of stable. 1,434 athletes tested positive in the past eight years. Oxandrolone long term, we can say, oh, it's, it's less than 500 picos, but oxandrolone has its own problem. It's the same nice spectra, but the TMS derivative is not stable. We lose it with time. So, but these are the long terms that we have now for several steroids, and it's really a breakthrough. We can see each time that the long terms were added to the lab's procedure and increase. It's again, 360 athletes. If I just give you a, an outcome for the DHCMT that we had in our lab, remember that the MRPL is 2,000 nanogram per ml. None of the cases that we have. None of the Russian athletes retested during the IUC retesting would have been reported positive. You have the M3 and its epimer in all the cases that we had. The average is 40 picogram per ml. The highest we've seen is 120. In the first years, the average was 64. Nowadays, we play with eight picos, 10 picos, something like that. You've seen this this morning. This is a single dose, 140 picos. MRPL is over there. So none of this was detectable before we had the eye sensitivity instrumentation. And look at the nice work, yes, here, it's one picogram. That won't be detected even in the, the more sensitive lab. The detection period is around here, 20 picos. And this is what he showed you this morning. We took samples provided by Sydney. We tested them. This is the epimer. 
We can go here, there's no identification here, it's not possible, but it could be detected for 263 days and here for around 100 days on a single dose. And it's all detectable cleanly. It's like each compartment are emptying and then you go, it's going there. But look here, 48 days, we're still at three picos. I don't know how it came because we never seen an athlete sample like that. Nonetheless, last identification, 30 pico is there. Other steroids with low LOD, well, example of Chlortisto, I give you this one. If you Google cl Clostable, you will just find China powders. So this is on the internet. It has a chlorine atom, so this is a substance that we see. But we've investigated a bit more. These are our findings in the lab. MRPL, 5 nanogram per ml. Only one case at two. All the other ones are low. Look at the prevalence of use. Mexico, Honduras, Nicaragua, Brazil, Guatemala, Panam, it's all there. Well, this is the cream. This is this clostable cream that is available. Two minutes, it's, it will go so fast in English. I could switch in French, it's going to be more efficient. So, <laughs> so this is, we can detect very well, but we know this cream is causing a problem. Finally, the, the end of it is that we have to be careful when we're operating laboratories with very low sensitivity. If you can have two techniques for confirmation or more than one metabolite, this is great. This was the screening. I thought, you're mad. There's no stanozola there. Well, they could confirm it. So this is the confirmation procedure by GCMS, low level but meeting the criteria, and LCMSMS. So we feel safe. The belts and the straps, we're happy. But if you have only one metabolite, then it's more risky. We have to verify we were once contaminated because the people who were weighing the standard kept their lab coat on and they've contaminated us. We cannot have the people waxing the floors because it brings the solvent in the instrument. We can have sediment, we can have different analytical condition or an unstable instrument, B not confirming. So this is the example I want to give you. A 15 picogram per ml being confirmed, no problem, criteria were met on March 1st. B sample on March 26th, won't confirm. And these are the results. The peak is there, the peak is nice, the peak is very nice, it, it fails on one ion transition. So then we moved to the thermo and we could have a confirmation. So this is the risk with these instruments. It's in, we know there are instability, but I guess that we were not nervous. We were, ha, huh. but this is life. And so finally, this is the conclusion. I said it three times, but this is the final one. <laughs> so this is from 1984. U.S. Olympic um, cycling team caught with, not caught, but reports of blood transfusion, and the doctor there was that it was someone else's blood. We don't like it very much. It could be, it could hurt, but the performances, for all I read, the performance could not be uh, improved, and this is where we are in 2019. This is the blood bag, and this is a blood transfusion. So this is... I'm not saying that we made no progress, but overall, we are still there. So it's not yet time to close the book. Thank you.